like I say, I like to come to the farm show. It's always fun, and you meet some people, and you see some old friends. I have a gentleman. I've seen him here so many years in a row. The first time I came in, he said, Kelly, he said, I want to show you a picture. Well, he showed me a picture of a rooster. He said, this rooster saved our lives. He said, believe it or not, some people have broke into the house, and he said that rooster was out pecking on the door and crowing and woke us up from the upstairs bedroom. And I thought, that's a pretty good rooster. And I looked down at the picture, and the rooster had a wing on. <clears throat> and I thought, well, I won't say anything. Second year, he came and he looked me up, and he said, how you doing? And he said, you know what that old rooster did? And I said, no. He said, the barn caught fire. And he started crowing at 2 o'clock in the morning, woke us up, and we all went, and he said, we saved the barn. And he said, I took another picture of him. Well, now a wing was gone and a leg was gone. And I thought, this is a hard farm to live on if you're a rooster. <clears throat> Third year, I came back, and I, he walked up to me, and I said, how's that rooster? He said, you won't believe it. But he said, we had a weasel get into the chicken house. And he said, he fought off a weasel and protected all his hens. And I said, I'm no doubt you've got a picture. And he showed me the picture, and the other wing was gone. <clears throat> I said, oh, buddy, I said, do you mind if I ask? I said, what gives with this rooster losing all these limbs and wings? He said, all this rooster has done for me. He said, Kelly, you just can't eat a chicken like that all at one time. <clears throat> I heard that, boo. Just for that, there will be essay questions at the end of this. <laughs> and I don't grade on the curve. <laughs> there was a misprint in your brochure. And for once, a misprint worked out. Because if you read, I'm supposed to be talking about lying hens. And you know what? I'm going to talk about lying chickens. Because I'm going to tell you how to cut your feed bills, how to get management, how to produce more eggs. And you do that simply by getting rid of those lying hens out of the laying flock. You know, things don't always come out as you plan, but the Lord does look after fools, especially when they're a long way from home. <laughs> Getting into the egg business right now looks pretty simple you go through the catalog you pick out what you want you write a check 26 la weeks later you've got pullets laying eggs well it's supposed to work that way but it doesn't and back when chickens were a true business on the family farms it did not work that way at all <clears throat> right now most of you are making a start simply by buying pullet chicks and going into the egg business. And you're probably selecting brown egg layers. And I'm going to warn you folks, I'm going to get a little hot here in this one. You may even step on some toes. <clears throat> but if you're buying sex link birds, if you're buying performance bred Rhode Island Reds, production bred Rhode Island Reds, cherry eggers, cinnamon queens, you're not producing heirloom brown eggs. Those are crossbreds, hybrids, and by definition, and the only standing definition we have right now, an heirloom egg comes from a purebred hen that was recognized and sanctioned by the American Poultry Association no later than 1950. Sex link red birds are generally produced by breeding a Rhode Island red rooster to a Rhode Island white hen. And that's not even the Rhode Island white hen that's sanctioned by the American Poultry Association. It's the single combed hen. And I'm going to say this. I'd say 90% of you in here that are under the age of 50 have never seen a Rhode Island red chicken. They're not these little light red things that come bopping out of the hatchery boxes. 
A good Rhode Island red is so dark red, she's almost black. <clears throat> when you see these lighted and faded colors, it's because they've been crossbred. Production red or performance red, probably within three generations back there stands a white legged rooster. <clears throat> Sex linkage is done for one reason and one reason only. When the baby chicks hatch, you can tell the little roosters from the little females. And those little males get pitched at the hatchery. It's the antithesis of sustainability. And the Cornish cross broiler, that cross cannot be repeated on the farm. You say, Kelly, that's white rock and white Cornish. Well, let's make two points. Anyone tried to buy any purebred white Cornish in the last 30 years? I know of exactly two independent white Cornish breeders in the United States, and neither one of them has birds to sell and hasn't for the last five years. These birds are locked up on farms owned by the companies, and they're produced to the point where you go onto a farm that's producing broilers for heat stock, you've got one house marked breasts, one house marked legs, and another house marked growth. And then they start pulling breeding birds out of that to put it together for the purpose to produce what you all come to call a Cornish cross, or what I think of as a beach ball with legs and the tendency to die young from heart trouble. <coughs> Here again, we're going to go back to the only legal definition we have to work with right now. An heirloom broiler cannot be harvested any younger than 16 weeks of age. These fast broilers, these five-week Cornish, they're not heirloom. It takes the bird that long to develop for the meat to have the quality, the texture, the flavor. <clears throat> and you need to start thinking about this aspect of taste and flavor, both in eggs and in poultry meat. More and more, we're seeing a tendency to sell into the ethnic communities especially you broiler producers, and they don't want these birds. The Cornish cross broiler is produced to do one thing, chicken strips, popcorn chicken, and chicken nuggets. It's all breast tissue, and those breasts are so large and so pendulous that they are no longer adequately supplied by nerves and blood flow. <coughs> so in essence, what I'm telling you folks is all of the shortcuts that you're being handled by, handed by the poultry industry right now are roads to nowhere. <clears throat> they lock you into off-farm sources of supply. You cannot reproduce them in any way, shape, or form. And if you're my age, you remember it about 10 or 11 years ago when the animal rights people got to the postal service and they stopped handling baby chicks through the mail for almost six weeks. And that ended the broiler trade. It just stopped. There are only two sources of supply, to my knowledge right now, in the entire United States that are selling broiler eggs to independent hatcheries. And they have a minimum purchase order of 300 dozen at a time. So think about that. If the mail goes away, which it can very easily. Already you've, you've got a group in here called the bird shippers that they've done a good job. But the western airports will not ship birds now. The northern airports have temperature restrictions and the southern airports have temperature restrictions. <coughs> and right now today if you're buying baby chicks, I'll almost guarantee they're coming out of only one of three hatcheries in the United States and I don't care where you sent your check. They're coming out of southern hatcheries. You've got three left in the United States to truly ship and hatch the year round. <clears throat> but the point I want to make is we're coming into this chicken thing in a way that surprised everybody. No one thought it would ever come back at this level. There are only three universities right now with major functioning poultry training programs. Kentucky, Georgia, and I believe Maryland. The University of Missouri does not have a single poultry specialist in the field. 
you're on your own out here. No one thought this was ever going to happen again. And it's starting us with a lot of problems, including the fact that the genetics that are available to you primarily have been on the shelf for the last 60 to 70 years. <clears throat> Most of the big hatcheries no longer hatch, have their own breeding birds. They buy eggs. You might have a single flock selling to six, seven, or eight different hatcheries in different parts of the United States. A few years ago, I bought a nice set of white Wyandotte chicks out of a southwestern Missouri hatchery. That hatchery's been gone. But to compound it, I like the birds so well, I told my wife, I said, we're going to add some more. I'm going to go from a different source. So I ordered from a large hatchery in Minnesota. That's enough of a hint to you. And here come my box of baby chicks in September. Well, my first batch came from a hatchery and was sent through the Clinton, Missouri Post Office. My Minnesota chicks came through with a Clinton, Missouri postmark. <clears throat> so I kind of got a notion that they were brother and sister. And that's the point here, folks. I did a lot of work with breed preservation. And we used an old phrase, you've got to start with what you have. That has actually now been attributed back to an old purebred barred Plymouth Rock breeder named Mr. Ralph Sturgeon. But what that says is at this stage of the game, whatever genetics you can access, that's where you're going to have to make your start. And a lot of them are pretty common. There has been no true production testing carried on in my lifetime. The only way you can get exact, honest figures on a hen to produce a backer with numbers is trap nesting. Trap nesting takes time. That bird is identified individually. She goes into a nest, lays an egg, a door drops, and she does not come back out of that nest until you lift that door, pick up her egg, write her band number down, the bird she was bred to, and log it in. Kelly, that's a lot of work. 1930, there was a leghorn hen that came out of the West Coast that laid 345 eggs a year. It was a lot of work that paid off. And you're seeing a lot of birds offered now in the catalogs, 260, 270 egg performance on these hens. Call them up and ask them if that's on those birds. What they're going to tell you is that's historical performance data on a breed. It probably isn't even the line they're breeding out of. <clears throat> if you're into the brown egg business and you're buying Bard Rocks, Buff Orpingtons, figure on going in 160 eggs per hen per year. If you're going with some of the more unique ones, especially the birds that are heavy bred for meat, 90, 110. And that's the point I want to make to you right off, folks. <coughs> there are egg-laying chickens, and there are meat chickens, and then there's this great lie called the dual-purpose chicken. <coughs> and I'm not kidding. That is the great lie, the dual-purpose chicken. Nothing lays like a leghorn, yields like a Cornish, or lies like the man that tells you they are. <laughs> There's two distinct types. Egg-laying type, and that's why I want you to go back. We've got some pictures. But an egg-laying bird, her predominant body development is behind her legs. That's the oviduct the egg tract, the whole nine yards. The meat bird, it's in the front of the legs, the breast tissue. The purebred meat birds that we have, for the most part, are descended out of fighting stock. That broad breast was initially a trait for fighting chickens. It was muscle. It's what they took to stay in the pit, and it's what they needed to take a hit and stay in the pit. A little bit of a side right here. <clears throat> if 
few years ago, you heard all the panic over the bird flu. And they're starting to talk bird flu again this fall. <clears throat> it's traced to Asia for one big reason. Those folks handle chickens entirely different than we do. And I'm not here to criticize them. But most of those people are cockfighters. The birds are actually kept under their beds in their houses to protect them. And there's an old, old cockfighter's trick, and you need to learn this to know why the risk is so great in Asia. A bird that is spurred in the pit, in the breast, the head, or the neck, the blood will clot. If you jerk him up and you suck those clots out and put him back down, he'll keep fighting. And those people are regularly sucking fresh, raw chicken blood into their mouths. And that's not me telling you. That's National Geographic, folks. So let's not panic. And let's get our story ready when the people come out and want to ask the questions. But layer type, meat type, we're going to show you birds of each category. And you need to know that. <coughs> I've talked about trap nesting. <coughs> What we're going to demonstrate back there is called the Walter Hogan Evaluation System. Mr. Hogan went into the chicken business in 1865, which was the beginning of the glory years for chicken production. And he went on to see what some people call the Petaluma miracle. But what launched the modern livestock industry was the white leghorn and the electric incubator and that traces back to the Petaluma and the California Imperial Valley where those folks got real serious about good chickens real early on. So they came together and the principle is that tight tells. And there are traits you can look for to evaluate your chickens. And this is the part I want to really make imperative to you. Folks, you can look at the catalog pictures and you can open the boxes, but you need to start taking those chickens in hand and knowing what they are. And you should start culling your chickens on the day they come out of the incubator or you lift them out of that shipping box. In the early going, you look for the obvious. Curled toes, split beaks, navel ill. Curled toes and split beaks are indic indicative, I'm only going on one cup of coffee, <coughs> are indicative of excessive inbreeding, the wrong kind of inbreeding. And the curled toes come generally because the chicks are weak and they have trouble coming out of the shells when they're hatching. And we'll show you some curled-toed birds back there. But that's your first step, your first indication. And you need to be evaluating these birds roughly at every two-week interval. And now I'm going to get a little bit on the <coughs> economics end of it. Those of you who are in the egg-laying business, let me do a little math with you. Let's say that come February, you decide, I'm going to need 100 pullets next fall to go into the egg-laying business. Okay. Buy 130. Because you're going to cull through that many before they go into the laying house. And you're going to cull them roughly at every two-week interval. Now, I'm old, and some will say a bit lazy. But at every two weeks, and we're breeding our own, we bring our chicks out, and we set them up on cages at line of sight, <clears throat> small numbers at a time, and we give each one of them a serious hard look as well as holding them in our hands. We're feeling for weight and development and growth. And if I give you only one thing to take out of here, when you're evaluating these pullets, keep only the largest, the fastest growing. Because what you're doing is you are naturally selecting for health on your farm. We can keep alive the weak and the poor doing, those that fail to thrive. 
but they get in our pocket. And the trouble is now we're even getting to the point where we can allow them to breed on. <clears throat> like I said, I was into some preservation work, paid some terrible dollars, kept some older chickens, <clears throat> and we tolerated a little bit of <clears throat> a problem because there just weren't that much genes in the business. But if you're going to succeed in this as a business, you've got to get ruthless with them. <clears throat> and don't hesitate. A little secret. A good, successful chicken person likes chicken salad. <clears throat> and I'll follow that with another point. You can tell a lot at a chicken by just looking. I was given a <clears throat> set of uh, buff Plymouth Rock hens. They were in their first year of lay, kind of laid in it. And uh, just as you'd never look a gift to horse in the mouth, you don't want to look too hard at a gift chicken. But I was given six first year pullets and a rooster. Well, five of them were beat up and faded and worn down. And there was one, and she was a big old girl, and boy, she was pretty, and she was shiny, and red comb, and bright yellow legs. And she should have been eaten when she was about four months old because she wasn't laying eggs. Every bit of food that she ate went to keep her big, bright, and shiny. A chicken in production takes from her own body to produce eggs. That's why the good Lord put this molt cycle in here. You buy that 130, you take that 100, you take them through on your farm, you're going to go from roughly 9 to 11 to maybe 13 months of production, and then they're going to go into a molt. They have to shut down. Now, that molt will last anywhere from 5 to 12 weeks. A culling factor. The faster they drop those feathers, the better. The earlier they drop those feathers, the worse. I've got a couple of hens right now at home that if there was a Playboy magazine for chickens, I've got the cupboard girl. But they're going to stay there because they drop those feathers all at once. And they're going to put them all back on all at once. And they're going to get back to laying quicker. Those early molters, they're saying, I quit. I've laid all the eggs I'm going to. <clears throat> now, there's something you all are, some of you here are probably encountering right now. We went from extreme heat to we had a pretty nasty little cold spell the end of September. Then it got warm again. Some of you have been have come in, coming up and asked me, said, Kelly, why did my birds quit laying? Well, you've got one of two possibilities. They're going into what's called a premature or a neck molt. If you look at them, they're losing a few feathers, generally in the neck area. Okay, they'll overcome this, but they've had a pretty good hit of weather stress. Take them in hand. Make sure that those abdomens are soft that those pelvic bones are in good shape, then boost your protein a little bit, and you'll bring them back out of that. <clears throat> Some of you, are you hearing your birds are sounding like me this morning? <clears throat> a little sniffly sound. You may even have some eye swelling. You've got some respiratory trouble. <clears throat> and that's part and parcel of the season. Now, some of that can be management-induced, and some of it... It's just a part of the game. Don't, when the weather starts getting cold, close those chicken houses up that tight. Man, you go nailing up the plastic and bringing in the wooden doors, and you've got them in there, and you think, boy, they're going to be warm. And then about the third day, you start smelling ammonia in the chicken house. They need fresh air, and they need an exchange of air on a regular basis. And the other thing is... And this is true of any livestock species on your farm. When you or I walk into a livestock building, we experience that environment at head and shoulder height. Well, there's nothing 
short of giraffes that I know of that kind of get into that same range with us. Your chickens are at floor level or they're on the roost. Get down on your hands and knees where they live and start looking for knot holes and splits and cracks and then you get it roost tight and you start looking for knot holes and splits and cracks because if you're getting a breeze across them at night while they're on the roost, they're chilling and they're not comfortable. So remember that you have to evaluate them at their environment and not yours. <coughs> and yet, well, this time of year, of force of habit, is uh, I'd be at home with a bucket of lime whitewash, whiten up the insides of the chicken house, put the lime whitewash into the roost and all, and it's natural preventative. Now, I'm trying to do two things here today. I'm doing a little problem solving as I go, and I'm talking to general manager. If you have a question, put your hand up. I'd rather try to ask it while you're fresh. But, folks, don't get those roosts great high up in the air, especially if you've got these bigger brown egg-laying birds. A buff Orpington, a Wyandotte, her roost shouldn't be any more than 18 inches in the air. The further she has to jump down, the more prone they are to injure their feet and legs, especially the bottoms of their feet, and they will develop a problem called bumblefoot, which is essentially infection. Small wound, they walk into the dirt and the manure and it'll pack in. There are cures for that, but don't get caught with it. Do not get your nests higher than your roost, because they'll go to the highest point to roost. Keep them off the tops of those nests. <clears throat> now, another re question I've been fielding right here a lot today is, and yesterday and the day before is egg eating. Well, we all see these neat little pictures of these wall nests. You know, they're about 12 by 12 and the little pot pole. And they, you go in there and they, you think that's neat. And I'll save my money and I'll order one of those out from NASCO. The best way to stop egg eating is to use the old colony nest concept. You make your chicken nest two feet deep, two feet high, five feet long. You make your nest four feet wide, four feet deep, 18 inches high. One hole into the nest. The chicken goes in, she'll go to either corner. And all is on her mind is laying that egg and getting out through that hole again. No chance to come back and pick at eggs that are laying right there at beak's reach. Those concepts go back to the 20s and 30s. They were hard-earned ways to build nests, but they work. If you've got an egg-eating problem at home, or you believe you do, go out there. They'll give themselves away. An egg eater will have egg stains on her beak and face and down her breast. Now, there are a few things you can do. There are some natural cures. My grandmother would blow eggs, fill them full of red pepper, or she'd paint eggs real hard with a red pepper paint. <coughs> and that works sometimes. It doesn't work. You can take an egg eater, and you can clip that top of that beak until it'll get sore, and she'll quit pecking. Or you can take that egg eater and roast her, and you'll know she'll never do it again. <laughs> Remember that chicken salad thing? That's a theme today. Stay with me. Yes, sir. Would you give those one more time, the two that I see most commonly are four feet by four feet by about 18 inches high. You can make that out of plywood. Two sheets of plywood will get you a colony. And a nest that size should be big enough for up to 35 hens. The old timers that were using hanging nests made them two feet high, two feet deep, five feet long. They looked like a tube or a tunnel, and they put a 12-inch pop hole right in the middle. <clears throat> and here again, keep them low and put a stiff enough top on them so they won't have any inclination to sit up there and roost. <laughs> but let's... Uh,
talk a little bit about what we need to be putting into those houses right now. And I'm going to talk some chicken economics. How many of you are selling brown eggs? Don't be ashamed. I'm, I just said I'm going to growl a little bit. I, I haven't shot anyone the whole week. And I've even sat down and talked nice to an extension agent. <laughs> but the point is, folks, the brown egg birds, with a handful of exceptions, were not bred for egg production. Quite simply, for the last three generations of American consumers, the traditional, the heritage egg has a white shell. <clears throat> you go home and I've got dark brown legrins and I have got buff Orpingtons side by side in the pens. Come spring, I will guarantee that I will sell more buff Orpingtons than I will dark brown legrins. But... For every two of these buff Orpingtons that I have to house and feed, I can house three or four of the brown legrins. And on an individual basis, those brown legrins will outlay those buff Orpington hens without any performance breeding by 35 to 50 eggs per year. They were bred to lay. They have a higher metabolism. And a lot of people are saying, well, aren't those old legrins flighty? Well, folks, at one time, the ancestors of Hereford cattle would kill you if you came close enough to the calves. It was bred out of the aggressiveness, and we need to get busy breeding some of that flightiness out of our legrins and our menorcas and our anconas. Those are birds that are called the Mediterranean class. <clears throat> they were bred for egg production. They lay a large white egg. They lay an large egg in relationship to the body. <clears throat> now what has happened in the commercial egg sector is they quit breeding for performance. Somewhere, I suspect in Arkansas in the 1950s, they had a secret meeting and people named Tyson and Purdue said, well, we're going to come up with this little hen that will fit into the cage. She will lay a large egg in relationship to her body. She will lay pretty hard for a year. And then we're going to put her in a big truck. We're going to take her to Kansas. We're going to euthanize her, and we're going to bury her in a landfill. Because we've got all we can wring out of her. We don't want to pay to take her through a moat. And Campbell's really doesn't buy old hens to put chicken in their chicken noodle soup. They bought a pretty good wine dot back in the 1920s and they're still using the meat from that bird. <laughs> and, uh, but the point is, they're bred to be thrown away. A lot of chickens are thrown away. Six out of every 10 eggs that hatch are little roosters. Your hundred red sex link pullets are leaving 160 brothers back on the loading dock at the hatchery. And they live for maybe 12 hours, and then they're euthanized. Now, someday someone from PETA is going to decide to raise holy blue cane with that little fact. And believe me, they will. And that may be the thing that causes us to lose the U.S. males for baby chick shipping. But like, they're content with a type. They're happy with what they get. And they don't care if we lose the males because they don't mail their chicks. They've got tractor trailers and big fleets, and the big outfits will move theirs. The Tysons and the Purdue's own own the genetics that produce the broilers. They actually buy and sell breeding lines. It's as if you or I could go out tomorrow, put enough money on the table and say, I own the Black Angus cattle breed. They own the Cornish cross broiler. And they'll do whatever they please with it. And folks, that bird, there never was an intention for that bird to go into chicken tractors or that bird to range, or that bird to ever be a natural product. 
They were bred to produce as many strips and nuggets as they could, as fast as they could, as cheaply as they could, and they do not breed on. Time after time up at our bird market in Silex, people come and say, well, we bought these Cornish cross and we're going to raise some of our own next year. And then we put a little hat in the back and everybody throws in a quarter and well, when is their breeding stock going to die? 11 weeks of age, 12 weeks of age, 13 weeks of age. I'll say this, every one of you that's working with them, invariably 90% of the Cornish cross birds you find dead on your farm are dead face forward or straight on their back with their feet in the air, and the combs and the heads are dirty blue color. They have died of strokes and heart attacks. They don't have brains enough to come through a Missouri hot spell and walk 100 yards to drink water. Those breast blisters come because they're too big and cumbersome. Good broiler men now that are trying this, until the birds are gone from the farm, they're bedding them in four to five inches of peat moss. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to preach a little bit. I got wound up. Those of you who have got a 10 by 10 or a 10 by 12 chicken tractor and have got 80 or 100 broilers in it, shame on you. You just might as well build a big building and put 10,000 in there. You're packing them as tight and you're treating them as hard. Packed in, crammed in. Well, Kelly, I can get more birds. I ain't going to eat your chickens. The Pakistanis and the Guatemalans and the, the Bosnians that come to Silex, they aren't going to eat your chickens because they've had a good chicken. They know what it tastes like. It's not supposed to feel spongy and look absorbent. They talk about taste and texture and chewing ability. If you're where you're supplying Caribbean people, they want a tough chicken. It's not the way you or I think of tough. They want a bird that has been conditioned and exercised, can go into a cooking process that takes a long period of time, uses a lot of spices, and will come out of it still tasting like chicken. That's their definition of a tough. And that chicken takes every bit of those 16 weeks to get there. And more importantly, they realized a hard lesson. They'll pay 10 or $12 to get that chicken. <coughs> or more. Because you don't find them. You don't see a lot of what chicken used to be. I pulled a book down off the shelf the other day. It was the old Meat Tweeds book. And they started running down the category. Point of fact, the USDA at one time didn't have anything called a broiler. They had a spring chicken, they had a fryer, and then they had a roaster. Well, Wall Street and its wisdom got together and said, we will put them all together and call it a broiler. You know, they put together the nuclear industry and called that Three Mile Island. And <laughs> the thinking behind this is a little bit shaky, folks. You can't do all things out of this. Try to buy a roasting chicken lately. <clears throat> we had a neighbor back home found a niche market gentleman passed away, he was an older man, 15th day of August every year he would order out 50 buff Orpington cockerel chicks. Well, you buy 50 of those at the end of August, sometimes they'll send you a check and pay the postage to get them gone. But the point was, come November and December, he had the heirloom traditional heritage alternative to the honeysuckle white turkey. And when he started 25 years ago, he got $7 a piece for them. Right now, such a bird in the right place will bring $20 to $25. We have smaller families. We have lots of people that don't like turkey. 
Remember, folks, one definition of eternity is two people in a turkey. <clears throat> My wife and I, we enjoyed our Christmas turkey, and we enjoyed it on Super Bowl Sunday as turkey sandwiches. And it very nearly made it to the Easter dinner. <laughs> this is the alternative. I think we forget that the pork people made a lot out of it, but the other white meat always has been, always will be chicken. We just need to do the job of marketing it. <clears throat> but the next step in all of this, and I mean this sincerely, is there's a real quality issue with what's coming out of these hatcheries. A lot of the hatcheries don't own breeding birds anymore. They farm them out, they buy eggs. You folks that are on the internet, there's a concept called pop-up hatcheries. And I tell you what, I can be in the hatchery business tomorrow and I can show every one of you how to do it. You put up your little web page, you rip off somebody else's advertising pictures and you put it up there and you say, I'm going to sell you this, this, this breed of chickens and I want this price for them. And you send me the money. Then I'm going to get on the phone to Ideal Hatchery in Texas and I'm going to buy the same chick you want for less money and it's going to come to your house in a plain chick box. I have no more knowledge of what's in that box than the man in the moon. It's being done. Do this, little tip. Wherever you see poultry advertising, look hard at the pictures. And if you're seeing duplications of pictures, you better start thinking about they're all coming from the same place. Point two, don't fall for the pictures in the catalogs. Those are paintings or they're idealized. They've been reworked pictures. Those beautiful pictures that are the American standard of perfection, which I think everybody should have one, are artist concepts. There's never been a chicken on earth that looks like any of those pictures. That's what a perfect chicken is supposed to be. I expect to see them someday, but not on this side of the Jordan River. <coughs> Tell you a little story. Three old farm boys found themselves standing before the pearly gates and they started through and an angel grabbed me and he said wait a minute and he said boys he said you've got to know that St. Peter in here is a chicken man and there are chickens all over the place and he's very very particular he said if you hurt one of these chickens you will pay for it well they hadn't been there 20 minutes and an old boy stepped on one of St. Peter's chickens. Squawk! He looked up, and here comes St. Peter. In one hand, he had a black iron chain, and in the other hand, he had the ugliest woman that man had ever seen. He grabbed him, and he wrapped that chain around his arm, and he wrapped it around that woman. He said, you shall be together forever. Well, the other two were scared to death. Their friend went wandering away through the clouds. A millennium went by, and one of them got cocky again. Stepped on another chicken. What? Here comes St. Peter with a silver chain. And believe it or not, an uglier woman. Drug him out, wrapped the chain. You shall be bound together forever. And the third guy said, Nah, I'm country enough. I'm not ever going to step on a chicken. Thousands of years went by. An angel came up to him and he said, St. Peter wants to talk to you. And they took him before St. Peter. And there stood the most beautiful woman he'd ever seen in his life. And a golden chain. And he wrapped them together with the golden chain. And he said, and you shall be together forever. And the old boy was walking away and he's admiring this beautiful woman. And he said, dear... How do you think we ever came to deserve this? She said, I don't know about you, but I stepped on a chicken over here about 20 minutes. <laughs> <coughs> I redeemed myself, did I? 
Yeah. Took you down a long road to get there, but we got there. <laughs> Folks, what, what I'm wanting to say to you now is we've talked about the 20s and the 30s, and they were an important era. Because everyone with chickens was a chicken breeder. And they were doing their own work. And they had a brisk market. There was a wonderful trade. I've got magazines from the 1880s with chicken breeders in Yonkers, New York, and Brooklyn. I always like to tell a story about a young man who came to New York City in the 1930s. Yes, they had chicken shows at Madison Square Garden in the 1930s. In the height of the Depression, a young man's name was John Thomford, came off a farm up in New Hampshire, had a Rhode Island red rooster. Won the whole thing. Big Chicago hobby farmer businessman came up to him and said, son, I'll give you $300 for the rooster. He said, nope, nope. The show went on. He came to me and said, son, I'll give you $600. And he said, no. Nope. John Thomford, at the height of the Depression, turned down a $3,000 cash offer for a single rooster. And he walked out the door. But what he didn't tell the man from Chicago was that in his hip pocket was a notebook with orders for 30 birds at $250 apiece sired by that rooster. One rooster bought an old country boy a farm. <clears throat> Folks, we're not quite there. But last fall, on the internet, the first trio of chocolate Orpingtons was offered in the United States. Chocolate is the hot color in poultry. The birds were imported from England at a great deal of expense. There were two pullets and a rooster, and the starting bid was $5,000. <clears> and go home if you've got the Stromberg's Hatchery catalog. Turn through the industrial birds. Get back to that little page about the middle of the catalog, and it says Stromberg Select. 100 as-hatched baby chicks as hatched, 60% of them are probably going to be cockerels. And they only want $990 for 100 baby chicks. But they will pay the shipping. <clears throat> $990. And that's not that unusual now. I've got a friend that's an individual breeder in Indiana, and he's selling baby chicks for seven dollars a piece. $175 plus shipping to send you 25 of his baby chicks. He's old school, he's down there in southern Indiana, and he's making the birds work. He's starting his own little hatchery. And the thing is, this is available to all of us. Because the other secret they don't want to tell you about chickens from the hatcheries, and I'll almost guarantee this, when you open that box, they're either full brothers and sisters or they're half brothers and sisters. And they're coming out of pretty small flocks, especially if they're a rare breed. I had a friend a while back that bought white Favaroles, and he was just thrilled to death. Come to find out, he had one of only three flocks of white Favaroles in the United States. Point two was no one else wanted white Favaroles. <clears throat> you can get too far afield. You can come from too narrow a point in time. But make that assumption. <clears throat> Let's say you're getting more serious now. You've got your egg-laying flock, and you're saying, I can do better. And that's key. You have to start doing better. You have to become a chicken breeder. And that means... Starting your own program, identifying your own birds, and following your own breeding pattern. Now, let's say your heart was set on something kind of unusual, and you had to go the hatchery route. So you've got 25 as hatched. Let's just say for the sake of argument right now, oh, uh, speckled Sussex. All right, out of our 25, you're probably going to get one real good trio, two females and a male, and two so-so pair. Save those extra roosters. 
Because if you lose or if you say, well, I'm going to save some money by going through the winter with one rooster, I'll guarantee you almost positive. But he'll die in the spring, and it'll be another year before you're back into the ball game. But from your good trio, with 80% production and 80% hatchability, you'd be surprised how many baby chicks you'll hatch in that first season. You take the very best pullets that you raise, and you breed them back to their father. And you take the very best young cockerel that you breed, that you've raised, and you breed him back to those two older hens. That's called a rolling mating. Father, daughter, mother, son are not nearly as close breeding as brother, sister. That's the closest mating you can make. They're getting the same shot of genes down both sides. That's those folks that have the family tree that goes straight up. <coughs> so you want to follow that. The concept is called a rolling mating. And what it does is once you've identified these better individuals, you can start keying on them and keep coming forward down the line with them. Now, there are two alternatives to this. <coughs> The point is you can do it from this way and then you want to try to flare out a little bit. So come from one or two more sources. And I'm going to tie you up with a little bit of pen space. Start going to sales and buying cheap rabbit hutches, folks. Because you're going to get multiple little breeding groups. So the first year or two, breed pure out of each one of these. So that you've got two or three lines on the farm that you know what they're doing. You're still keeping your commercial flock over here. But you're starting to make some work on this. And you're starting to produce some birds that you can put back in over here on this commercial. But then you're starting to get some identity established. <coughs> and then you can start putting together these genetics to create your own birds. But let's say you buy from three sources and never buy less than 15 baby chicks. Most places won't ship less than 15. And if you're buying ass hatched, you can order 15 ass hatched chicks and I guarantee it'll skew badly for one direction or another as far as the sexes go. It's a mathematical thing. But say we've got three lines here, then we're kind of happy. Okay, so we've got pin A, pin B, pin C. All right. The best young rooster out of pin A, bred to the best pullets out of pin B. The best rooster in pin B is bred to the best pullets out of pin C. The best cockerel from pin A goes back, to, uh, pin C goes back to the pullets from pin A. That's a rotational breeding. And you don't have to have a wash tub full of chickens to do that. Especially you meat bird people. Ten good meat type white rock hens will give you 40 to 50 baby chicks every week hatching your own. And they'll do that for 20 some weeks each year. And you can work on king on quality. <clears throat> With small numbers, you can know what's going on. I do this at home. My biggest breeding pen has five females and a male. And it's pretty easy. You go by there and you say, well, I'm only getting three eggs. Two of those old girls aren't carrying their weight. That's when you get provoked and you start really getting serious about evaluating. You get your hands on them. You kind of know... And we're going to show you what to look for back there. But you're going to have to get your hands on them. And then you're going to come down in numbers for a while. But you're going to start working on quality. And then you begin to identify, and this is very important, you know where the good roosters are coming from. Because your improvement in your breeding birds will come through your male line. Male, male birds influence female genetics. Females carry the male influence. That's why we have 
problems with genetic disorders because if it was the male that carried the male problems, you'd eliminate it. You'd spot it that quickly. So you're coming down and you're breeding <coughs> and you're working on this. And we're going to show you how to get your hands on a young rooster and find out whether he's got what it takes or not. So you're putting together this program gradually. And like I say, line breeding is in breeding, but it's not incest with the consequences you think of. Because above all else, remember what I said early on? What's the first two things you select for? Size and vigor. Size and vigor. When Robert Blakewell established the concepts of modern purebred livestock breeding, before any male, ram, bull, or stallion went into the herd book, he was bred to 35 of his blood daughters to make sure there weren't any defects in there. And we probably need to start need to getting that hard on our genetics again. Remember my chicken salad story? Starting to make a little more sense, isn't it? <laughs> so you're going to work through them, and you're going to make them better. Your farm isn't my farm. It isn't like any other farm in the world. The genetics you come up with that will work for you and you keep improving are being bred specifically for your farm, your environment, and your market. <clears throat> and don't ever forget that. You've got a different bug problem, bugs, I mean bacterial and diseases, than I do. Every farm on earth has them. If you've got a sterile farm, it's not a place to live, and it's not a place that you'll ever raise healthy livestock. <clears throat> so you're going to be working on that, breeding up your own line. The poultry industry is where the idea of breeding lines with breeder names on them came into place. Thomford, Sturgeon. On and on, those old names still stand up and they still earn respect where you can find birds bred that way. So you're going forward, you're building your own, and you're making them better. If you're doing your job, this year's baby chicks are better than last year's, and next year's are going to be better than this year's. And that's crucial. And you're going to have to be identifying these birds and selecting for traits. And that means pedigreed matings. <clears throat> Putting them together. You're going to have to identify your birds. Toe punches, wing bands, know where they are from the time they come out of the incubator. Actually, from the time they go into the hatcher. A lot of you are interested, I know, in the blue egg layers, the dark brown eggs, the speckled eggs. And you might laugh at this. But you better be doing the first job of selecting your roosters from the eggs that have those colors. That's where the hens will be influenced. He's 50% of the flock, two of them in a row, and that's 85% of your genetics. If you're looking for dark brown, and you can take these light brown shelled birds and you can breed them darker. On the 18th day, when it comes time to move them down out of the incubator, you place those better colored eggs in boxes, berry baskets, little wire, hardware cloth, little baskets with top, and they'll hatch in there. All right, gentlemen, put your hands over your ears because there's a cheaper way to do that. Sneak a pair of your wife's pantyhose out of the house, put those good eggs in one end, tie a knot in both ends, put them in the back in the incubator, and they won't get out of those either. Yes, ma'am. Do people still wear pantyhose? Well... <laughs> My wife says I better keep my mouth shut, but we're, 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 we're fundamentalist uh, Christians of the Pentecostal faith, and yes, my wife does. Okay. <laughs> yeah. uh. Is there a special store we have to go to buy those? I think it's that one that says D-O-L-L-A-R in front of the word store. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> but you identify them. Now, when you've got those birds... You have several options. If you want to do it on the cheap, get you a good permanent marker. And before you put them all together in the brooder, put a good dark mark in the top of the head of every one of them. You're going to have to touch that up every three or four days. You can get a tool that's going to cost you all of 
called a toe punch. Just as quick as your little chicks come out of the incubator in the little web of skin, you punch a hole in them. You can put 16 different numbers across the webbing on a baby chick with the different codes. When you punch them, make sure that little piece of flesh comes out because if it drops back in, they're fast to heal and it'll close up. At about the time they're a month old, you can get a leg band on them or you can get a wing band on them. You have to watch with leg bands to make sure they expand. Now I'm going to tell you how to save a little money on leg bands. <clears throat> you go to your farm supply store on peanut days or something, and you go over there and you buy that big jumbo jar of $8 pull tights. And you get the red ones and the green ones and the yellow ones. So. <laughs> and you pull them just tight enough so the leg can continue to grow. So let's say all your 2012 chickens, they've got a green band on the right egg leg for the roosters and they've got a blue band on the left leg for the pullets. And with the eight colors of the bands there, you can be banding chickens until the next peanut day in the next millennium. The little twist bands and the numbered bands are getting to the point where they're 50 cents a piece. The thing about the little pull tights is a pair of side cutters and they're snapped off and you can change them on. But you've got to keep track of them. You've got to know where they are from the time they come out of the nest. And that's why we go with the smaller groups. Carry that notebook. Do a lot of... I keep a diary for my incubator. I know where every egg is in a 480 egg incubator. Or I should know. <clears throat> Got a little greedy a few years ago. Found a real good set of barred Plymouth rocks in western Illinois. Bought the birds. And on the way out he said, oh, by the way, Kelly... All the roosters have been running with all the hens on the farm. Well, I'd like to have known that before you had those birds cooped up the night before I came to look at them. So I went home, waited 11 days before I put eggs in the incubator. Had the prettiest hatch of little barred Plymouth rocks you ever saw, except for the last one out of the hatching tray, which was a barred naked neck. So the next day at the farmer's market, I sold a real nice set of bar chicks. God only knows what they were. Give me a dollar and a quarter a piece and take them home with you. It takes 14 days for a hen's oviduct to clean before you can be sure that she's being bred to the right male. 14 days. And you're not going to make all this progress overnight. But the wonderful thing about a chicken is they're fertile and they're productive. Within five to six generations, you can make a sharp turn and jack up levels of production. And if you're in a halfway temperate climate, you can get six generations of chickens in under five years. Roughly, you can go with an eight-month generation and they will work out. Now the old, old timers will tell you you don't save pullet eggs to hatch because you don't know how good a hen she's gonna be. And I can't argue with that. But I will also tell you this, that most of your commercial hatcheries, the breeding flocks that supply them come the 15th of June to the 20th of August Every one of those hens is sold to save money. That's when they stop shipping, and they're back next spring selling you eggs that were hatched out of pullets that were produced the year before. They do it to cut corners. The old-timer said, wait two years. Now, a question I've been asked up here is, how long can you keep a, a hen on the farm and expect production? She will lay more eggs in her pullet year than any other year. Each year that passes, her level of production will go down 10 to 15 percent. In her second year, the eggs may begin to get larger.
but they will be fewer. By the third year, with the fact that you've lost so many to culling, and your fertility is starting to decline, and they're producing fewer and fewer. Remember our 130, 100? When you're coming back for the second laying cycle, you're probably going to have 80 from that 130. And it's going to wind down. I worked for preservation. I had some hens on the farm that were 10 years old, and we were still getting eggs. But we weren't getting a great many. But we were talking about the fact rare breed, very few on earth, and the chicks had greater value. 